Welcome to Macro Pro and Friends webinar series. And today we are doing our seventh CEU for this 12 days of Christmas. Wow. You know, every time I say that, it is such a mouthful. But you know what? We get through it. And I hope that all of you guys are enjoying uh, our webinar series and that you're getting the credits that you need. Today, I'm being joined by Wendy Stevens of our Southern California. No, she's in Northern California. Hi, Wendy. How are you? Hi, Diane. I'm doing well. Thanks. I am in Northern California still. Yes, and I, I think the weather is really beautiful for you guys right now, isn't it? Yeah, we um, actually are hitting 29 in the mornings and about 46 to 50 during the day, and then it drops back down overnight. So um, if it rained, which it's not, uh, we'd have some snow, but uh, we are a little chilly. Yes, well, that's part of what makes Christmas Christmas is that little chill in the air. So we we have some really great programs that are coming up for the rest of the um, for the rest of the week, and then also for next week. So if you have not yet registered for those, please go to macroprod.com, and we will be glad to um, get you signed up for that. It's on the right hand side under upcoming events, and we. I hope that you can get as many CEUs as possible. Today, we have great speakers, Wendy. Thank you for getting them for us. Absolutely, absolutely, Diane. Today, we have uh, a couple well, of really good speakers, but before, before we talk about the speakers, I just wanna go over a few housekeeping rules. So let me give you the information on this part of the 12 CEUs of Christmas. Um, our webinar today is worth one California Continuing Education Unit. That's one. And you must be logged in to go to webinar. So you need to be able to see the presentation. You need to be able to see the speaker in order to get credit for being there. If you call in by phone, the credit won't apply because the, the platform in which we use is not able to track you having logged in. So in order to get your certificate, it's important for you to know that you need to be logged in. And your certificate will be sent to you within an hour after this CEU unit is over, after our presentation. And if you have any questions or if there's any difficulty, check with your IT department when opening, because sometimes it's just a firewall that needs to be um, worked around in order to open that. Diane, do you want to talk about the rest of our coffee beans? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> So we, uh, if you would like to ask our experts any questions, you can put them in the question box and Wendy and I will monitor that and ask that of our guests. Um, in addition, there are handouts that are attached to this webinar. So please make sure you download those so you have it for future reference and you'll have contact information from our speakers should you need to get a hold of them. And then lastly, if you really enjoyed this program, you wanna see another part of it, you will be able to see it on the Macro Pro YouTube channel. There's This program will be there as well as every other program that we've done in the past. So we invite you to check that out. All right, well, Wendy, uh, we have some really great, great clients. And these two ladies from Michael Sullivan's firm is, you know, are one of them. So why don't you introduce them? And thank you, ladies. Thanks, Diane. We have uh, Nancy Hill and we have, um, Kristen Bueller with Michael Sullivan's office, and we are so grateful that they could join us today and provide us information about not only some of the services that they provide, but talk about the denials and the importance of proper investigation. I may have just butchered that, so you might have to do a little correcting for me. Sorry about that. So uh, thanks, ladies, and we will wish you all the best. Thanks, Wendy. Thank you. I'm Kristen Bueller, and this is Nancy Hill. We're from the um, Emeryville office of Michael Sullivan. For you that don't know, we have Michael Sullivan has um, the book Sullivan on Comp. Uh, we provide litigation defense in workers' compensation, subrogation, some employment issues. We have offices all over the state of California. Um, we recently uh, just opened an office in Reading. And today we are here to discuss the importance of timely uh, accident investigation. 
and we'll be discussing the importance of the investigation, um, how to proceed, what employers and the employees have to do after they have been injured, the duty that claims adjusters uh, have to investigate the claims following a report of injury, basically how you deal with medical treatment if a claim is delayed, and what you need to put into a denial. So it's a proper and adequate denial. And then we'll also talk about um, the standards for substantial medical evidence. And usually that applies to medical reports from QMEs. And then of course, uh, we'll have time for questions, hopefully. Also, as we're going along, if you wanna ask questions, you can ask us questions so we can stop and address the question right away. Otherwise, if you think about a question after we're done, please ask um, when we're done and we'll address those. So for now, I will introduce you to Nancy Hill, who will begin. Hi. <clears throat> so one of the most important things to look, like, look at is obviously it is the employee's obligation to report an injury. And generally speaking, under Labor Code 5400, an employee has a duty to report the injury to the employer in to the employer in writing within 30 days. But of course, as we all know, the workers' compensation system was created to provide benefits to injured workers. So immediately thereafter, there is a selection of caveats created to make sure that there's a way for an employee to get benefits if that is not done. So one of the first things we look at is Labor Code Section 5402, which indicates that the employer's knowledge of the injury from any source can pretty much negate whether or not the applicant, I'm sorry, or the injured worker filed an actual written report of injury within 30 days of the injury. And looking at any source means if another employee indicated to the employer that they were aware of this injury and the intent for the applicant or the injured worker to move forward, that would be more than enough. Um, the employer's presence at the time of the injury can be more than enough. Oftentimes you'll see an injury happens and the employer will pass the applicant or the injured worker on to go seek medical treatment right off the bat. All of this will then negate the need for the employee to actually give a written notice of injury within 30 days. Um, and as you can see here, when they say any source, it's very imp important for even understanding that verbal uh, communications will surpass that very quickly. Now, under 5403, the failure to provide notice doesn't even uh, in and of itself defect or make the claim uh, inadequate. From there, the employer has to actually show that that failure to provide notice in some way misled or prejudiced the employer from being able to defend or effectuate the claim properly. So it creates actually a very high standard, a very high bar for the employer to um, overcome if the applicant or the injured worker does not in fact provide a written notice within 30 days. This pretty much shows that right off the bat how very much uh, the system is set up to provide the injured worker benefits. Um, it's very rare, in fact, I think I have never in fact uh, been able to accomplish a dismissal under 5403 because it's a very broad notice of provisions under 5402 that the employer is almost automatically equated with notice and there's a very heavy burden to prove to show that the employer was really biased or prejudiced by this lack of notice. Now, Notice is very important because it immediately sets a in motion a uh, list of duties put on the employer regarding things that they need to do at this point. So after receiving knowledge of injury, the employer is required immediately to provide the employee information regarding their rights for compensation benefits um, under the same guise or the same idea. If the, there is a death involved, those same notices need to be provided to the employee's dependents. Um, 
one of the first things that needs to happen is a DWC claim form needs to be provided to the employee after the injured uh, the injured worker has provided notice to the employer regarding an injury. This notice needs to happen very quickly, in fact. The employer needs to provide this notice within one working day of any lost time or any medical treatment received that was greater than first aid treatment. Now, this can be a questionable thing going back and forth and things that uh, can actually be a matter of fact presented in a court case as to whether or not the treatment received was beyond first aid. Generally, that'll require more than one visit or one that, more than a visit and a follow-up release treatment. Um, it's important to have documentation within the employer's file showing these things. Now, if the employer fails to provide this notice, one of the first things that happens is there's a tolling of the statute of limitations, which is something that employers want to keep in mind because at that point, it creates a window in which the applicant can bring up this injury at a much later date and have a harder time for the employer to say, hey, we, we knew about this. You had one year to provide um, us with notice and a desire to seek benefits, and you didn't. If you don't provide this uh, claim form to the applicant, you haven't started that uh, period of time for the statute of limitations to begin. Now, filing of the claim form, this DWC form, once it's completed and returned to the employer, it starts a, a multitude of things. One, it creates a, a timeline for the worker to be able to file for pen penalties if they don't receive benefits uh, related to their claim. The next thing it does is it opens up the ability for the injured worker to uh, start the panel process if there's any disputes related to their injury or needs for benefits that the employer or the insurer is denying. The next part, which was already uh, briefly mentioned before, is the statute of limitations. It will then toll that statute of limitations. Uh, two areas of the tolling would be for the one-year statute of limitations for lack of proceedings for benefits, and the next is the five-year statute of limitations related to the WCAB's um, jurisdiction over the claim. The next thing that it does as well is it starts the time frame for the applicant to receive up to $10,000 in medical treatment before, up until or before the claim is denied. Interesting part is, is that the uh, regs go back and actually uh, kind of give a little leeway on this and the filing of the claim form does not actually necessarily require, that, that is not necessarily required for the employer to be obligated to provide these benefits. Once again, showing that the worker's compensation system was obviously established in order to provide benefits to the injured worker. So as I was talking about, with the filing of the claim form, this is what actually triggers the 90-day investigation period to figure out whether or not the <clears throat> employer wants to accept or deny the claim. This is that same 90-day period in which the applicant is entitled to the $10,000 in medical benefits up until when the claim is either denied or, or the 90-day period finishes. This 90-day period or this delay period is one of the most important periods for the employer to really work on investigating whether or not the claim should be denied, especially on a factual basis. And I say that because on a medical basis, it is a lot harder to get medical um, evidence completed within this quick 90-day period. Now, if the claim is not denied within this 90-day period, Unfortunately, what happens is we cross over a threshold in which the, play, the claim becomes automatically compensable or presumptively compensable. This now creates a much higher burden for the employer as far as proceeding with this claim and believing that it's, it is not compensable. So if you look at normally when a claim is filed, the burden uh, remains on the applicant at first to prove that they have a compensable claim, that their injury actually occurred relating to their work. Now. If we pass this 90-day period and we have not denied the claim, it now becomes a, presumptive, a presumptively compensable claim. At this point now, it, it passes over the burden to the defendant to prove that the uh, injury is not compensable, which is a much harder burden to prove on our part. <clears throat> now that it's become a Presumptive claim, we pass over into the world of whether or not we can rebut that presumption. Fortunately, it is still rebuttable under Labor Code Section 5402B. 
we are able to rebut this presumption, but unfortunately, we've now been restricted to only being able to rebut this presumption by evidence that is discovered subsequent to this 90-day period. And if that wasn't bad enough, case laws made it even worse, indicating, for example, under SCIF v. the WCAB in 1995, indicated that not only can it not be based on information that uh, or evidence that was discovered after that 90-day period, court went even further to say, you can't even use evidence that you could have reasonably procured during that 90-day delay period. So what it's done is made it very um, clear to the defense to, our, to go forward and make sure that you do adequate and um, prompt investigation at the very beginning of a claim to determine whether or not this claim should be accepted or denied, or you're going to find yourself in a situation where you may end up with a presumptive, presumptively accepted claim, which you may find evidence later that clearly shows that this claim should not have been accepted, but you can't use that information if you could have figured it out at the very beginning of the claim. So we have a case, we have Honeywell, that kind of has gone through, this is a Supreme Court case that has gone through and basically provided a pretty good, clear four-step process for the initiation of claims. And it kind of summarizes the four things that I've just gone through already. So one of the first things um, that's important to note is that the employee bears the initial burden of notifying the employer of an injury, unless such information or notice is unnecessary because the employer already knows of the injury or claimed injury from other sources. But I think on this level, it's very obvious and it makes perfect sense that an employee, especially an injured employee, sometimes to a greater extent unavailable, uh, if they're hospitalized or something bigger has happened, doesn't need to go out of their way to file a written notice of injury within 30 days if it's obvious that the employee was injured at work um, and the employer is very aware of it. The next at this point in time is that the employer now bears the burden of informing the worker of all of their compensation rights related to that injury <clears throat> and give them a claim form. And that claim form is what would initiate all of the desired benefits that they might want. I mean, I think this makes sense as people that are in the workers' compensation system and do this all the time, it seems very automatic and natural. But in talking to people outside of the workers' compensation system, a lot of these things seem very foreign and don't make sense. So it's important that the people involved with this every day let applicants know what's going on. Now, at this point, the applicant or the employee has a claim form. They've been informed of their rights. What do they want to do about it? And I think this is also important that an applicant has the desire to go forward with their claim or to not go forward with a, their claim if they don't want to. So at this point, I think it is important for the employee to decide whether to file that claim form or not. And that's the third step that's outlined in Honeywell. Now, once the claim form has been fired, filed, it's now passed back over to the employer then to promptly investigate this claim, whether it's valid, determine whether or not they want to contest this claim, and start an investigation or complete that investigation within the first 90 days to determine whether or not they want to uh, accept compensability at this point. I think a really important part of this that is noted in Honeywell as well, it's highlighted here, is that that 90-day period for investigation doesn't start when the injury happens. It starts once the applicant or the injured worker says, hey, I do actually want benefits and I want to proceed with this. And that's important because a lot of people get injured at work with minor injuries where they may have a minor injury, receive a little bit of treatment, and realize they don't want to push it or go forward with it. If the employer was obligated to start that 90-day period on every single one of these injuries from the date that the injury occurred, it would be overwhelming. It would be overly burdensome and not possible. But allowing the employer to wait until that filed claim form happens, saying, yes, I intend to proceed with this, that's a good time for then the employers to jump in and really move forward with making sure they do all the investigation they can. Now, this duty to investigate, which I think is one of the most important things and things that I often find missed on a lot of my cases, which I don't get as an attorney until several months after oftentimes that 90-day delay period. Sometimes I get them before that, but we have a duty to conduct a reasonable and timely investigation upon receiving notice or knowledge of an injury or, or a claim for workers' compensation benefits. On the factual side of things, this means going down to the uh, employer's office or having the employer do witness 
uh, statements. Talk to people in, around around them. Try to find out what happened. If there were if there was anyone present, if it makes sense. Uh, doing that after the fact is a lot harder. You know, doing that three months later, six months later, when a claim has been passed on to me is a lot harder to do. Um, this also helps as far as figuring out if the facts of what the applicant has presented line up with what happened that day. I'll get files, you know, six months later, and one of the first statements I get from the adjuster who found out from the employer is, oh, he didn't even work that day. Well, now we're six months later. That would have been very helpful a lot, a lot earlier on. Um, because finding something on a factual level is one of the um, easiest ways to do that is with information from the very beginning. Now, for each of the ways that we attack this, there's also looking at the medical evidence involved. Like I said earlier, it usually takes a bit longer than that 90-day investigation period. Sometimes when denials are happening or when there's a consideration for denial, that very first uh, medical treatment report on a medical level could say, yeah, the mechanism of injury just doesn't line up for, uh, with you know, the medical evidence that I'm seeing, but that's on a much more rare basic basis. Um, what you're looking for in this is that the regulation really puts out there that the applicant has to, or the injured worker has to participate in what's going on. And we can't restrict investigations into a defense claim to try to prevent benefits from being paid based on using the, de the delay period at that point in time. Um, and looking at the investigation period from only the 90-day uh, delay period as something that we go into very quickly is great, but that, that duty to investigate needs to extend after that point in time because we have a duty to continue to look into the facts and what happened in this case or in each individual case and move forward with that information. And it's important to recognize that although we are looking for information to figure out whether or not this was a work-related injury, we can't hyper-focus on only the negative facts. It's important to also make sure as we're going through our investigations to also note facts that are beneficial to the applicant or line up with the story that was told or, or the reiteration of the mechanism, mechanism of injury as well. And as I mentioned or I touched on a little bit earlier that we have a duty as well as the applicant, but a duty to cooperate. So on the employer side of thing, the, things, the employer really needs to cooperate with the insurance carrier when the claim gets started. And this I went into a little bit before, looking at whether or not the injury was witnessed. So the employer and the insurance carrier should really be talking to one another as things get started, have a really direct connection with um, either the manager on site or who it was to try to get employer witnesses, um, people who knew the employee at work when it happened. Um, I've had once, I've had cases before where it turns out the applicant told a coworker that he had injured, injured himself over the weekend. And then we get this report and that doesn't come out until six or seven months later. Um, also, one of the first things I ask for when I get a file is the personnel file. Um, has he been getting in trouble for a long period of time before this happened? Uh, long vacations planned that were denied. Um, finding out whether or not, just from the employer's perspective, if they had doubts as to whether or not this claim is an acceptable claim or not, if they believe, oh yeah, he got hurt, this is definitely something that happened, or if they have reservations as well. Um, wondering whether or not uh, the claim should be accepted or not in the end really is a factual and medical issue that can go either way. But I think that if there are questions up in the air, indicating that the claim should be denied is okay. We're gonna go into a little bit more of that because ultimately, ultimately in the end, you are gonna present all these facts and evidence to a judge to have the decision made. The important part is to show that there was an investigation looking into what you were doing and you were actually looking for facts and information to support the, the decision that you've made. So looking now at the um, immediate provision for medical treatments, this is another thing that happens as soon as the claim is accepted. So once the claim is accept, I'm sorry, once the claim form is filed up until the point in time when the claim is denied um, or the 90 day delay period is finished. So once the claim form is filed, it triggers this duty <clears throat> for medical treatment. And this happens within uh, one day after the employee files for the injury, 
we have to set up and make medical treatment available. Now, there's actually a duty for us to be proactive during that delay period and allowing them to get medical treatment. This is one of the first things or one of the big things that I see cases end up getting litigated for is that the applicant's trying to get medical treatment in the very beginning and they're, they're struggling and they're having difficulty getting there. So this might be a very good place to avoid ending up with litigated claims is making sure they get into the <clears throat> uh, MPN doctor where, where it's authorized or it's treated because the Supreme Court has indicated basically once we have notice of an injury or the employer has notice of an injury, they have to instruct the applicant where they can go or the employee where they can go to get treatment and whom they can and cannot see because if they don't, we basically lose the right to say where they're allowed to go and they can go wherever they want to seek medical treatment at that point in time and we'll basically be li liable for any reasonable medical treatment at that point in time. There's a couple of cases out there basically supporting this idea that if there's a delay in scheduling this initial appointment, the applicant's gonna go ahead and have the ability to treat outside the NPN. I find these two cases very interesting because one, at least to me, the original Kim versus BCD listed up here, seems to be like a reasonable time frame as far as allowing the applicant to, to treat outside the NPN. We're looking at an attempt to go treat in July, <clears throat> 28th of 2013, but actually wasn't scheduled for the medical evaluation until October 21st of 2013. This is clearly an extreme delay in the ability to get medical treatment. But in a follow-up case very similar, Shin versus BCD Tofu House, the applicant at this point in time was, was looking for authorization for treatment on August 28th. I believe this is eight days later, was, wasn't authorized for eight days later on September 5th of 2013. 13. In the same case, or in this case, we get the same outcome that uh, they were allowed to treat outside the MPN. So we do have to be on top of in these delayed cases, making sure we get the applicant into MPN authorized treat like treaters so that we don't end up getting sucked into outside treatment uh, locations. And I'm not sure if a lot of you have dealt with this, but I know I have. Once they start treating with an outside doctor, let's say the claim does end up getting picked up, and you're now ready to try to move the claim back into the MPN. Most doctors will write up and indicate that a transfer back into the MPN would cause some traumatic issues for the applicant. And I believe that they're allowed to continue to treat for up to a year if they're able to hit that threshold. So now we've lost control over the applicant's medical treatment for approximately a, a year. So it is important to make sure, even if we're during that delay period, that we get them to doctors that we want them to treat at instead of other doctors outside the MPN. <clears throat> All right, so one of the things we're looking at here is when we're in this 90-day period, we've got to decide whether or not we can issue these denials. And basically, form and sub substance of the denials, we've got to decide how do we deny claims? What different information can we use? So. The regulations provide that if a claims administrator denies a claim, they have to provide this denial and the reason for it. So one of the important things that is set out there is it's 90 days. And if we miss it, we've talked already about the fact that you run across uh, the presumption that the claim is now accepted at that point. So the denial letter must be sent no more than 14 days after the determination of denial was made. But I think that's risky. I think we're pushing it if you do that. I would always highly recommend that this letter goes out before the denial period is done uh, because you don't want to have that battle over missing it because of the potential risks that are involved of ending up with a presumptive um, accepted claim. Now failure to send the denial within the 90-day period doesn't necessarily prevent the employer from being able to deny the claim but now you're set up in this position where you have to prove that the time the claim was timely rejected and go through the process of setting out um, evidence showing that that information was communicated to the applicant before the end of the 90-day period. Um, now, if the denial is based on medical reports, obviously we need to make sure we include a copy of whatever evidence it was that we're using. So if it's a medically claimed denial, mechanism of injury, things like that, we need to then put in there whatever supporting evidence it is that we decided to use to deny that claim. Kind of a little ahead of myself on that last one. Basically, there's three different things that you can use to deny a claim in that 90-day 
period. Um, the first one that you're looking at is a factual basis. Uh, ones that I've come, run, run across a lot is they weren't even working on that day of the injury or somebody else comes in from work saying, yeah, no, he said that, again, it happened on the weekend, but then he decided to report it, things like that. Uh, medical evidence ones, I've rarely been able to get a client or a, a uh, applicant to a QME within that 90 day period, let alone get the report in time. Uh, but I have found a few times being able to get the applicant to a PTP who then says, this just doesn't make sense. Um, I have quite a few on the legal basis, the coming and going rule, um, applicant was the initial aggressor, intoxication, or with under CT claims, so 5500.5, uh, we're not the last party involved in the CT claim, or the CT claim should have started sooner, things like that, so you can push the liability onto another party. So these are the things you want to look at at the very beginning of a claim to try to decide if there's a basis to deny it. <clears throat> now, what's really important to take a look at and pay attention to is if you didn't adequately investigate the claim, what happens? So if we haven't managed to do this and we issue a, we issue a denial and it's not valid, um, what do we do about this? So Fortunately, if we go forward and we have not investigated well enough, but we still in our gut know that this claim is not right and we issue a denial anyway, um, and maybe we don't have enough factual evidence to support um, our denial at this point, it doesn't necessarily preclude our denial altogether. Um, and we have supporting um, case law in that direction we are still able to go forward and support with what we've got going on. So for example, in Mendoza versus Huntington Hospital, the board held that an employer could still request a QME after denying a claim for the following reasons. So the applicant hadn't presented any medical evidence to support an industrial causation. The applicant's medical evidence on industrial causation was not legally substantial, and we couldn't determine the compensability without an evaluation on medical causation. So really in this particular situation, there just wasn't enough out there. But as far as the court held at the beginning of this case, there wasn't also a lot of investigation on our part one way or another. So fortunately, they said we were okay to move forward with the QME in this case. And just the fact that we issued kind of a generic denial in this particular case, uh, it was still okay to go forward with it. Now, there are still consequences for denying a claim without um, an adequate basis. And at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and let Kristen take over and tell you a little bit about what can possibly happen. Okay, so um, I am gonna talk first real quick about consequences for inadequate claim denial. And obviously the um, most important thing to remember is that you can, um, be monetarily fined for up to 1,000 for failure to investigate a claim and up to 5,000 for denying a claim without any factual, medical, or legal basis for the denial. And you can also be penalized under Labor Code Section 5814, which relates to unreasonable delay of benefits. And this can this applies throughout the life of the claim it doesn't just apply to investigation and denial so if you're if you pay benefits late you can be um, penalized under 5814. also if as nancy discussed if you don't um authorize medical treatment that can result in the applicant or the injured worker being able to go outside the mpn which as she discussed can cause a lot of problems also, the WCAB may make an adverse inference in favor of the applicant if the employer fails to conduct a reasonable and timely um, investigation. So that means they can take certain facts that the applicant says as true, and that can really harm you um, if in the future, uh, especially if you proceed to trial. Um, so that is about the investigation, and I'm going to um, discuss also standard uh, for substantial evidence. So in order for evidence to be admissible at trial or for a judge to be able to rely on it, it has to be substantial. And that's something that we as lawyers are always um, dealing with. 
And as you can see, there's on the slide, there's different factors you take into account when determining if a report is substantial medical evidence. And I'm gonna go through each one separately, but just an overview, the, um, the report must be based on reasonable medical probability. It must not be speculative. It must not be erroneous. It must not be based on inadequate medical history or examination. It must not be based on an incorrect legal theory. It must not be conclusory and it must not be beyond the physician's expertise. These are very interchangeable and they overlap a lot. So I just wanted to give you an overview um, before I go through each um, one individually. So the first thing that you want to look at is if the opinion is based on reasonable medical probability. And as you probably all know, medicine and science are not exact. There's many variables. So we've created a standard that a medical opinion only needs to be based on reasonable medical probability. It doesn't have to be based on certainty. We know doctors can't say, this is 100% correct. So we've applied the standard and it's really, is it more than merely possible? Um, so doctors need to look at the medical evidence, obviously, but then they also need to assess all the facts of the case when they're providing their expert opinion. So they have the facts and the medical evidence. And if their opinions don't take into consideration both of these, then it's not based on reasonable medical probability. So you always want to look at when you're looking at a report, what is the applicant telling the doctor? Um, it is helpful if it says um, that the doctor, if the doctor states that his or her opinion is based on reasonable medical probability in the report, but just because it says it in the report doesn't mean it's true and same with the opposite, just because it doesn't say it in the report doesn't mean that it's not based on substantial or it's not based on reasonable medical probability. I get certain doctors who that's like their stock response. When I'm taking their deposition, they always say, well, based on reasonable medical probability, and then they make some conclusory statement. Well, just because they say that doesn't mean that it is based on reasonable medical probability. So you really, you need to look at how the doctor explains their opinion. And a doctor's explanation is a key theme throughout all of this. Um, obviously, we are not doctors, so we need the doctor to explain it. And oftentimes, you can take a doctor's deposition to either shore up the report. So if you read a report, you like the report, but you say, eh, it's a little bit, it's kind of hard to tell if it's based on reasonable medical probability. You can always take the doctor's deposition to um, make sure that it is, or you can also take the doctor's deposition to poke holes in the report and to show a judge that this report is not based on reasonable medical probability and therefore is not um, substantial medical evidence. Um, the report or an opinion cannot be speculative. It can't be a guess. Um, speculation is an objection used by lawyers across the board in all areas of litigation. Obviously, evidence cannot be speculative in order to be admissible. And again, a medical opinion, it has to be based on factual or, or medical basis rather than pure speculation. And um, you need to also look, a doctor will look at the facts the medical evidence, and then they'll also bring into account their experience. So they've treated X amount of patients with the same or similar conditions, and the outcome is always X, Y, Z. So they can use all these things to come to a conclusion. Um, like I discussed earlier, medicine is not 100% accurate. And so a lot of opinions in medicine are speculative, especially when we ask them to assign numbers, for instance, apportionment. Um, when a doctor says, oh, 30% is apportionable to non-industrial factors, this is somewhat of a guess. Um, but we, we ask that the doctors use their medical judgment to, um, to come up with an approximate percentage. 
And again, many doctors will always respond like based on my experience, based on my, um, based on these studies, this is how I came up with this opinion. And again, it is really important that the doctor explains why their opinion is based on the facts and evidence as opposed to just conjecture. And so again, you can take a doctor's deposition and ask them, is this a guess or is it speculation? And have them respond to that and explain why it is not. Um, I just want to talk about apportionment again with regard to speculation because that's very important. That's usually the areas of the report that we deal with with applicants' attorneys trying to attack the doctor's um, opinion. And when you're looking at apportionment, you want to look at did the doctor review diagnostic testing? That's objective evidence. And um, so MRIs, EMG studies, um, x-rays, you can look at them before the injury, after the injury. Those are concrete things a doctor can look at in coming to an opinion on apportionment. But you also want to look at the facts, what the um, applicant has told the doctor, and obviously a review of the medical records. And as long as the doctor is taking all those things into consideration and explains it, properly, usually apportionment, an opinion on apportionment will stand up and will be substantial medical evidence. Obviously, it's not okay to just, and I've seen doctors do this, it seems really obvious, like you can't just apportion to prior non-industrial injuries. If there's no evidence or facts that there are prior non-industrial injuries, but doctors have said like, oh, and 10% to non-industrial injuries, just because they feel like there should be apportionment. Um, the next one is a, a, a medical opinion has to be correct. It can't be wrong. Um, obviously, if it's not substantial medical evidence, if it's erroneous. Um, and this often happens when you've got, again, objective testing, which establishes that either the applicant was injured or not injured. And um, for instance, if a doctor gives an, an injured worker very low PD, and then, but there's an MRI report which shows significant pathology. Then obviously that opinion is wrong if you look at the objective evidence. And it goes vice versa too. You could have a doctor say, oh, this injured worker is in DRE4, but you have an MRI which shows little to no pathology, then it's, it, it could be wrong. But the doctor can explain that away. So if the doctor's explanation is based on the facts, medical evidence, perhaps studies, then um, sometimes if the diagnostic testing does not support the opinion, it's still substantial medical evidence because the doctor has explained why. So you always want to look at a report. You want to make sure the facts are correct. And you also want to make sure that the objective evidence supports the opinion and you will see that in the reports usually at the end the doctor will say what subjective evidence the um, opinion is based on and what objective testing um, the opinion is based on um, this one inadequate medical history or examination it basically it goes hand in hand with a report that's wrong if a report um, is wrong um, or well, a report can be wrong if it's based on an inadequate medical history or examination. And um, you always want to make sure that the doctor has taken a correct history with the applicant, taken a history of the injury, a history of applicant's work, a history of the um, prior or uh, non-industrial conditions, and you want to make sure that that is accurate. But you also want to go through and make sure that the doctor, and this all has to be set forth in the report, that a doctor has done an ex a proper thorough ex physical examination of the applicant and that any testing done by the doctor is done appropriately. So for instance, range of motion testing, 
grip strength, there are certain things the doctor must do to be in compliance with the AMA guides. If those aren't done, then it's not, the report is not substantial medical evidence. Um, so obviously you also um, want to make sure that the doctor has thoroughly reviewed all medical records sent to them for their uh, review. Um, they need to list all of the medical records in the report that they reviewed in preparation of the report. Um, sometimes an applicant, well not sometimes, a lot, at least in my experience, an applicant will give a total different history to the QME than what is in the medical records. And if the doctor can explain how the inaccurate history doesn't affect his or her opinion, it can be substantial medical evidence. And so a lot of times you'll show the doctor, look at all this prior medical, look at all this, these prior medical records, they completely contradict everything the injured worker has told you. And the doctor will say, oh, well, I, you know, maybe the, their prior doctor was confused or maybe the applicant forgot. I mean, they, are, they can explain it away and they do. It also happens with sub rosa. But you still want to talk or question the doctor and say, why doesn't this inconsistency affect your opinion? And so even if the doctor doesn't change their opinion, you can poke holes in their opinion and then later on argue to the judge, this isn't substantial medical evidence because it's not a correct history um, that the doctor was relying on. Um, uh, just like we as lawyers, and claims adjusters, we need to be familiar with medical terminology. The same goes with the doctors. They need to be familiar with legal um, terminology. And if they misapply a legal theory or um, don't understand it, then the report or the opinion is not substantial medical evidence. And so terms such as permanent stationary, temporary disability, um, MMI and apportionment is a big one. Doctors sometimes have a hard time understanding that like apportionment goes to the cause of the permanent impairment, not to the cause of the injury. So you really want to make sure that when a doctor is applying a legal principle, it's being applied correctly. And it's, there's an example here if a doctor says, oh, an injured worker is PNS because they returned to modified duty that's not correct. And so that's, that opinion is not based on substantial medical evidence. We know that permanent and stationary has nothing to do with return to work. It is more as the applicant rehabilitated from the injury. And um, here we've got um, the reg that defines um, permanent and stationary. And it's essentially if the injured worker is not expected to improve or um, get worse within the next one or two years. Um, again, you can take a doctor's deposition, flat out ask them, do you understand the, the law with regard to whatever it is that's at issue? Um, this next one, failure to explain, I've already touched on it a lot. This is, again, probably one of the biggest one. It's a common thread throughout. Um, you, the doctor has to explain why they've come to their um, conclusions. When I submit something to the court, you have to put the legal con conclusion and then you have to put the facts and the law which support your conclusion. You have to explain it to the judge and doctors, they have to do the same thing. And this is the single most important factor in determining whether a doctor's report is substantial medical evidence. And um, it should also, it should explain it in layman's terms. So. It has to be explained in a way that the parties and the judge can understand it. So even before it goes to a judge, me as an attorney, I want to be able to understand the report and why they came to that conclusion so I can determine if you need to do more discovery, you need to take doctor's deposition, or if we're going to attack that report, or if we're going to settle on that report. But if it's all in medical terminology that is that I can't understand, that doesn't help me. So um, again, sometimes you have to take the doctor's deposition and ask them, can you elaborate on um, your opinions here? Can you explain it to me in layman's terms? 
doctors do not testify at trial. So it is really important um, that the um, that you understand the basis for the opinion. Also, I just want to make sure that it's understood that you can have the first report QME issues. It might be substantial medical evidence. It may be well reasoned with facts, evidence. Then the doctor issues a supplemental report, and that one is not based on sub substantial medical evidence. And I see it where the applicant's attorney will write to the doctor and say, oh, doctor, isn't this true? Don't you think it should be this? And the doctor will issue a one-page supplemental report that says, oh, yeah, I agree. I'm changing my opinion. So when I write to the doctor and I ask for a supplemental report, I always say, please state the facts and medical evidence on which you base your opinion if you change your opinion. So we can have a report that's based on substantial medical evidence and well thought out and explained. Um, the last one is pretty straightforward. You guys probably deal with it a lot. It's um, it's when the founder is beyond the physician's expertise. If a doctor, like an orthopedic surgeon, gives an opinion on a psychiatric injury, that is not substantial me uh, medical evidence if it's beyond the orthopedic uh, expertise. And this is usually where you get have to get additional panels. The orthopedic surgeon will say, I think the applicant may have suffered an, a psychiatric injury, but it's beyond my area of expertise. So you need another QME to evaluate the um, applicant. Also, um, a doctor cannot form an opinion on a medical on a legal uh, principle, such as um, here we say on a special mission was the was the injured worker on a special mission when the injury occurred, or were they just in their normal commute to and from work? That's up to the trier of fact, not a doctor. And obviously, you know, as defendants, we don't like um, additional panels. It obviously drives up the cost of the claim and more PD, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but uh, applicants' attorneys love to write to doctors and say, doctor, is this area beyond your expertise? And then they can get a new panel. And um, that is it. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Nancy. Lots of really good information. Did you have a question? It does look like we had one question out there with whether or not we would agree with a person's supervisor who indicated that as an adjuster in an elevator and we hear about a workers' compensation injury, would that be sufficient notice to an employer to open a claim? So what do we think? And I think when hearing that, my first question would be if the person overhearing it would be the person that you would report injuries to. Are they somebody that you would, op would be one opening a claim? Or would they report to someone who opens a claim? So they have this direct line of responsibility regarding that position as the employer. So I think that would probably be my threshold question. Um, be, be, being that this person said they were a claims adjuster, uh, that lets me know they're very aware of workers' compensation injuries. They know what they're about. They understand the purpose of them. So hearing someone talking in the elevator about having had a work injury, I do think in that particular case, they would hold a responsibility to acknowledge that there was a work injury. And if they aren't the particular party to open a claim, they should definitely be taking that to the person that would need to open that claim. I think that's sufficient. Kristen, what do you think? I agree. Um, and I think that if especially if the person told someone else that the injury occurred that's sufficient to um that's sufficient to satisfy a report of a claim because then the employer it's it, the more people that get told within the employer the more people that know it's more likely that it's going to be oh someone in the employer knew within the employer knew that this injury occurred and they at least that kicks in that duty to investigate Exactly. Well, ladies, thank you so very much. There was so much information in there. Um, I hope that everybody downloaded the handouts because it was really informative. 
at this point, I'd like to see if any of you guys have a uh, closing comment. Wendy, maybe you'd like to start? Absolutely. I just want to thank everybody for joining us for uh, number eight of our 12 CEUs of Christmas. It's been so fun to participate in this. And we wanted to thank um, Sullivan and Associates Office for giving us such great speakers. And I just want to wish everybody a happy holiday season. Be safe, be healthy, and wishing you all the joy and prosperity of 2023. Nancy? Same here. I just want to wish everybody a wonderful holiday. If you have the opportunity to spend time with family, I hope you warm wishes and uh, I hope to get to present again soon. Kristen? Yes, thank you for inviting us to present. I also just wanted to say our email addresses are on this um, on this slide. And so if you have any further questions, feel free to um, email either of us. And yeah, I hope everyone has a great holiday. Stay warm and yeah, enjoy your friends and family. All right, well, thank you very much. Just as a reminder, tomorrow morning's presentation is gonna be on closing claims. So everybody wants to know how to do that. We have another law firm that's gonna be sharing with us. Again, we wanna wish you all a happy holiday if you can't join us for the rest of the CEs this month. Until then, we will talk to you later. Bye-bye now. <laughs>